Welcome to the RV Podcast. This is episode 441. And in this episode, we talk about RV electricity, do's and don'ts. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Wendlin and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride Jennifer. And uh, this episode uh, has us coming to you from the beautiful Emerald Coast of Florida's Panhandle. We are not far from Destin, Florida. The beach is beautiful, the waves are big, temperatures are in the upper 70s, and uh, we're thinking about leaving. (laughs) (laughs) That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Well, we've been here three weeks. We got places to go. Can't stay in one spot too long. That's the trouble with the RV lifestyle. We have Wanderlust, but we are planning to head uh, north to uh, Lablali Ridge. That's what we call our five acres little RV retreat. uh, Some land we own in uh, Tennessee at the Woodlands uh, near Linden, Tennessee, in Mid Tennessee, and um, like. um, most of the country, uh, the midsection of the country, it has had its share of storms over the past three weekends in a row. Of course, those storms, we'll have a news report on it in the RV News section coming up a little later on the podcast, but um, just a loss of life, devastation. Uh, We were a little surprised to look at our security camera for our property and find two trees (laughs) leaning across it. Nothing like smashed down on it, but they kind of like went over and they just like leaned against the roof. And And the good news is they were small trees. They were not huge trees. They're probably about maybe that big around, but that's still pretty hefty. But could have and there were you know loblolly pines, so they weren't like big heavy oaks. But thanks to our neighbors uh, Brad and uh, and Jim, we uh, they climbed up on the roof and with a chainsaw and gently uh, got it all cut off. And we're uh, going to head up. Grateful. uh, We are very grateful, and uh, we've got some great neighbors at the Woodlands. We do. And um, we're going to head up and see them all in a week or so. Hope to see as many as possible. Yep. Um, But uh, those dangerous storms are, uh, in fact, as we uh, get ready for this one, another one's supposed to be going through the country this uh, episode of the podcast. So be careful out there and know a place that you can go to if uh, you have to shelter. And the RV is not a shelter. (laughs) No. No. I think it's probably worse than a car. Yeah, it is. It really is. Uh, probably more surface for the, the wind to catch. And they're lightweight, and the wind can get underneath them, and it's no place to be. Uh, hey, we got big news about our summer meetup. Yeah, we finally got it together, and we're offering spots. Yes. And this summer meetup is going to be June 19th to the 22nd, this gathering, the summer of 2023. We call it the Meetup at Mackinac, and it is at the very tip of the Michigan Mitt, where the Upper Peninsula comes in, uh, right to, on the shores of Lake Huron. And it, it should be a really grand time. It, tickets are going really fast. We just announced it to everybody on Sunday night, and uh, two-thirds of the tickets are gone as we record this podcast. So if you if you want to go, uh, head over to uh, the special link we'll put in the description below, uh, rvlifestyle.com slash Michigan Meet. And don't be discouraged. If you decide you want to go and there aren't any spots, put, go on the waiting list because life happens and plans have to be changed. So opportunities for those that are on the waiting yep, list. Yep, if people cancel and as an opening of develops, we'll go right to the waiting list and and go from there. Um, but we're really excited about that. Meet up at Mackinac in the Straits of Mackinac, right opposite Mackinac Island. We hope to uh, see you there. So there's a lot of um, uh, action on uh, social media and we want to introduce a new segment of the podcast uh, called Social Media Buzz, Social Media RV Buzz. Uh, and uh, we couldn't think of how to do this any better than to touch the expertise of Wendy who is our social media maven. She uh, coordinates a team of volunteers on our RV Lifestyle Facebook group. And um, we just uh, thought we'd introduce you to Wendy and find out what everybody's talking about on social media when it comes to the RV Lifestyle. Well, joining us right now is somebody that, if you're a member of our RV Lifestyle Facebook group, you already know her. 
uh, Wendy is our social media RV lifestyle maven, and uh, she keeps track of the the tens of thousands of members. I think we're up to how many now? Nearly a hundred. We have more than one hundred and seventy thousand. More than one hundred and seventy. I keep track. It keeps going. How many? Just tell me how many people join a day. It's some days there's a couple, maybe three hundred wanting to join, and other days it's over a thousand. And Wendy kind of, uh, she's got a team of volunteers and moderators that help her, but she keeps track of all of this stuff. And we just thought that for us on the podcast, this is a great way for us to get our pulse on what everybody is talking about. So, um, Wendy, what's everybody, what's on everybody's mind right now on uh, social media? You know, we have a lot of people on the move right now. And as someone who just drove from Florida up, uh, north, the Michigan, I can tell you the roads are crazy busy. Traffic like you would not believe. And some of it's, of course, it's spring break time right now. A lot of schools are out. A lot of people are taking advantage of that and taking their trailers south. Um, but it is really crazy out there on the roads. But I have to tell you, not only are we seeing a lot of traffic on the roads and people talking about that, some of our members are sharing some really helpful road conditions they're running into, like Rocky. He shared a tip a few days back about some potholes, really bad potholes, just west of Flagstaff on I-40. He was warning everybody that there were rigs of all sizes and kinds broken down. We're talking broken axles, flat tires, even suspension that's a mess. And he was warning people to avoid that stretch of road. And I think that tip was really well received. A lot of people said that's been a bad section for years. So that's I-40 uh, near Flagstaff, Arizona. Yeah. I've seen others uh, on there talking about uh, I-65 between Louisville and uh, uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, there's also some pretty bad uh, stretches on I-75 uh, that people have talked about up in Ohio. So uh, that's good. People are sharing all that information. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. else do they talk about out there? Well, one post that got a lot of attention this week was about caterpillars. Apparently, this is Say what? caterpillars. You heard me right, caterpillars. Uh, Karen, she shared some tips, uh, something that she ran into in South Carolina at a state park there. Apparently, the caterpillars were so bad. We're talking like thousands of caterpillars swarming her RV, the tires of her RV, when she went outside to walk from her RV to the bathhouse, they were falling on her hair, on her clothes, they mm. ended up on the dog, they even ended up in her bed inside of her rig. It just sounded disgusting. Um, some members chimed in and said it's gypsy moths, and apparently the caterpillars are really bad this year. So some are saying it's going to be like this for another week, maybe 10 days. So if you're headed to South Carolina, be careful. Watch out for tent caterpillars. They're gypsy ones. They're gypsy right. caterpillars. Yeah. Oh, there's gypsy. I guess they're still tent caterpillars. I don't remember what the difference is, but they're kind of yucky. I think some of them bite you. Uh, yeah. I've never been bitten by one, but I've had one fall in my cup of coffee one morning <laughs> once in, in the woods. So, all right. Anything else that's uh, making you uh, take notice? I know with 170,000 plus members, there's oh, a lot of conversation. there's always some. But I have to say one that just made me chuckle was from a member of our group named Selena. And she saw this yellow sign as she was leaving the Apache Junction KOA. And it said, check, steps up, check, sewer cap on, check, wife in the car, check. <laughs> and I know many of us have seen that before, but why is it always wife in the car? I mean, there must be something to that, right? Well, I think a lot of men are so type A that they're going, they're going. And if the wife is in the car, oh, I forgot something. Yeah. So yeah. there must be truth to that I sign. I've seen be. it a lot of people. There might be. Wendy, thank you for joining us. Now, we're going to check in with you every week as you keep track of all the stuff. And we should tell everybody that... Uh, We'll put a link in the description to the RV Lifestyle Facebook group. But with 170,000 plus members, uh, hats off to you and uh, all your moderators who do such a great job of keeping things fun. Uh, we'll check in with you next Sounds week. Sounds great. Well, I just can't believe that. Did I hear that right? That sometimes we get a thousand signups a day? Yes, more than sometimes. Uh, we're, we're over 170,000 now. And uh, I think she said the it's almost always two to three hundred a day new people joining the group but uh, several times a week it goes up to as high as a thousand in a day 
and Wendy and her team of, uh, of volunteers help coordinate them, go through it, to vet them all, and then they keep track of it to make sure we don't, we try and get all the snide nastiness out of the group. It sneaks through, but we get it reported and we move those people on. Um, but uh, lots of action and it's really become a great resource for people. So it's a great way for us to tap into this podcast and to tell you what's happening out there. And we'll try and do that every week. And we don't mean to take away your freedom of speech, but we want to keep this on the RV lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, you know, you know what social media is like. And, and there are people who just love to agitate or get or are mean or snide or insulting. And we try and get them off. And you, people report them and we remove them. But uh, we have a really good group. And I always think, you know, a lot of times when people say something, they wouldn't say that if they were looking at the person. But there's something about being invisible. And uh, maybe you don't have quite as much mercy for what other people think. But um, we're not going to let them do that on our group. We try not. Yep. All right. When we come back, the interview of the week, and we're going to talk about waking your RV electrical system up for a new season of travel. Stay with us. The one thing that can ruin a perfect RV trip is a bad mattress. And believe us, we know. Over the years, we've had many and found all of them wanting until now. Now, we sleep on the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Quite simply, it's the best we've ever slept on. We chose a queen-size Aurora Lux Medium firm mattress that arrived slightly rolled up in a box. All we had to do was put it on the bed, unroll it, and wait for it to recover from the compression. And then we put the sheets and the bed covers on and found we slept so well on it that we ordered another one for our home. That's how comfortable it is. Our sleep is now so luxurious and deep that we can't imagine using a different mattress. The RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding comes with a 120-night sleep trial and a 10-year warranty. Shipping is free. If you're disappointed with the current mattress in your RV, you owe it to yourselves to try the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Something else that's very important is that Brooklyn Bedding manufactures all their RV mattresses in their own factory in Arizona. This means they're able to use premium materials at a reasonable price for you, with no middleman bringing up the cost. And right now, if you visit rvmattress.com slash RV lifestyle, you'll get 30% off your mattress with the promo code RV Lifestyle. Again, use the promo code RV Lifestyle for 30% off the cost of an RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. We're sure you'll be as thrilled with your RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding as we are with ours. It really is the most comfortable mattress we've ever slept on. Welcome back, and now it's time for the interview of the week, and the topic is that's on all of your minds, waking up your RV, getting ready to get out there and travel. You want everything good to go, no glitches, no problems, because when you're ready to go out that door and your, your bags are packed and your food's in the fridge, you don't want anything to stop you. And we've been talking about this now for a couple, three weeks. We've got a whole bunch of experts that we've talked to and more that you'll meet. And I guess if any, anything that's a takeaway from us, even after 11 years, is the importance of having a system, uh, a, a procedure that you follow when you get your RV ready to go camping. We've talked about dewinterizing. We've talked about uh, uh, just a bunch of safety steps, which we'll talk about uh, today as well. Uh, but in this uh, part of the podcast, we want to focus in on uh, the electrical system of your RV. And our guest is Mike Sokol, and Mike is um, a 50-year RV industry veteran, uh, and he is an expert on the uh, electrical system uh, of an RV. And we're going to talk about everything from batteries to waking up that system to putting water in a water tank uh, before turning it on, why you shouldn't do that. A bunch of do's and don'ts about your RV electrical system that you need to know as you start a new season of camping. Mike Sokol joins us now. Mike, it's always good to see you, especially now. It's springtime, and you're going to help a lot of folks in our audience because we're going to talk about waking up the electrical system on our RV. So let's start. What do we do first? And by the way, I should tell everybody where you are. 
I'm I'm in Funkstown, Maryland. I'm on I'm on Funkstown Hill in my <laughs> Funkworks lab. It kind of sounds like Batman, right? The Bat Cave in the Batmobile. Um, and it is spring in Funkstown right now, and it is indeed funky town. It I, I need I need that theme music, Funky Town. Uh, for, yeah, probably uh, a licensing issue. A, yeah, they'll hit me with a copyright thing, but we can sing. Uh, yeah, we sing. all every, we're all playing it in our heads right we're now. We're all anyway, playing it so in our heads. Okay. okay, Mike. So we're going to bring the RV out of storage, and it's time to get ready for our first trip. Uh, let's not make any mistakes for our people. What do they do first? Okay. So the key here is there were some things you should have done last fall. Maybe you didn't, but you will know now for next fall, make it a little easier the following spring. But let's just talk about the stuff you need to do right now. Uh, so the first thing you should be aware of before you, if you have, especially if you have any kind of a tank hot water heater, um, you want to make sure that you fill it up with water before you turn the power on. If you dry fire it, that is, if you turn the power on to the element while the element is dry, it doesn't even take a minute for this thing to turn cherry red and then melt internally and destroys the element. Now, you can go buy another hot water element, you know, electric water element, but you've got to have the special tool to take it out a lot of times. Plus, it's just a pain. You shouldn't have done it. Make sure you fill it up with water. Now, some of the small tanked ones, I think, have the same issue. Most many of you will have the the you know the bigger ones down under the sink wherever. But I think that most any of them that have got some sort of an electric element in element in them are going to have the same issues. You just want to make sure that you've got water in them before you turn on the power. We got the water heater ready to go. Now comes the batteries. So the first thing you're going to want to make sure is that you check your water levels on your batteries before you start charging these. Now, you should have put, especially if they're flooded lead acid batteries, what we call FLAs, you should have really got some sort of a, a battery tender or whatever to keep the charge up because your charge could be very low even if you pulled them out and set them in your garage or whatever for the winter. Um, they just self-discharge maybe 10 to 15% a month. You're going to want to use distilled water. You're going to want to fill it up to the proper level on there. In fact, I've got a couple of articles that I've done that show you how to see how much water you should have. Be sure to wear safety glasses. I watched somebody almost lose their eyesight because they squirted water out of a, um, a battery and squirted right in their eyes. So safety glasses when you're working around batteries are a must. Only use distilled water. Always check this before you begin charging. Now, that's for people with the, the flooded lead acid values. Some people also flooded have... Flooded lead acid. They also have those uh, six-volt batteries. So if you have six-volt batteries, the safest thing to do is to like disconnect one of the leads off of each one and charge them separately. Because what I've found is if they don't discharge evenly, when you charge them back up, they will not all come back up to full charge at the same time. So the safest thing to do, I mean, normally it's okay to just charge them all with a single 12 volt charger, but if they're dead, they're gonna be unequally dead, right? And when you charge them back up in series, they're not gonna all charge up properly. Best thing to do is just say, I'm gonna take a day each and charge each one of my six volt batteries, because it can take 10 hours to bring them up from flat, to bring them up properly. So any, disconnect any them, charge them at a time. Any hints on what you do with, uh, you know, you're going to disconnect them. That always gets a little confusing for people. Uh, they've got a red and a and a black uh, wire. Any any protocol there? So what you want to do, take a picture of it. What do they used to say? Take a picture. It'll last longer. Uh, before you take it apart, before you take it apart, when you're putting it back together, get the picture up on your phone or print it out or do whatever you want. And then what that will allow you to do is make sure that you get that hooked back up exactly the same way. If you get something backwards, even for a fraction of a second, you can try your, you know, your converter, inverter, some of your electrical appliances, any of these other things. And they say, well, it was only, it was only hooked up for a second backwards. And I'm going, it, it takes like milliseconds, microseconds to destroy stuff. So then you'll be out buying or at the very least replacing the fuses in your inverter. And and again, this will interrupt your camp, your first camping thing. 
before you take anything apart, tape it up, mark it, take a picture. Okay, the two wires, red and black, make a difference which one comes off first or take them, it doesn't, it's fine? Well, well, when you're disconnecting your batteries, you really want to disconnect the one that's closest to the negative terminal uh, that, that's hooked into the chassis first. The black one, the, the one that's there, because if you don't, if you take that wrench and you put it on the positive terminal, and let's say the wrench accidentally makes contact with anything metal, what it will do is it will just weld itself together and then overheat. Um, now, I saw this when I worked in a garage like I was 17 years old, and the guy was using his left hand, and he got his wedding ring trapped between the wrench and the chassis of the vehicle. It instantly turned cherry red. I heard him screaming because he had to yank this off and had welded it. He ran over to the sink and turned on the water, and the steam came pouring off of it. And I thought, this can't be good. So and take the black... Good wire off Tape first. Off first and then put it on last that way if you accidentally make contact with the chassis it's at the same voltage if you try to take the red one off first if the wrench makes contact with the chassis it will dump hundreds of amperes of current through it the thing will turn weld itself on there and bad things will happen up to the battery exploding all right so don't, don't do that no don't do that so uh any maintenance that we should do now that we've got these batteries that we're met, working around with it what should we do to get those batteries optimal well you can in fact you know if, if there's any bit of corrosion you know they make that little wire brush thing you can do on the terminals it just depends if they're a vehicle battery they'll normally have a lead post if they're a um an rv battery they'll generally have a flat connection um but i still think it's important to make sure that you have all of your um if there's any uh weeping of sulfuric acid, if it's a flood, flooded lead acid, you're gonna to wanna to clean that off with baking soda, make sure it's all clean. Uh, I will also tell you, when you're done messing with batteries, first off, go use old clothes. I, I, I ruined a set of jeans, perfectly great blue jeans last fall because I had my hands on a lead acid battery and I touched my pants. Now, uh, a day or two later, all the fabric rotted through. <laughs> and my wife's going, what did you do to your pants? And I'm like, oh, I was playing with batteries. Uh, so, yeah, batteries. make sure you wash your hands. I didn't ask you about the generator. Uh, anything, a lot of people have generators. Uh, you know, we've kind of worked through all that stuff. But we, we do anything with the generator? Well, your generators, what you should have done, what you should have done, is drained out the gasoline um, in the fall. Um, or at the very least, stable fuel supply, you know, uh, uh, fuel treatment in there. But if you have not, you want to drain that out. Um, I actually put in an extra dose of stable, and then I start over with fresh oil every spring. Uh, generators just lead kind of a tough life. Um, you, sh you should have, it, it's really best to change the oil in the fall before you winterize this thing no, uh, no. if not you could be starting your generator every month or two now some of those generators get their fuel their gasoline from the engine on motor homes you, you obviously don't have to drain those out right what you would want to do is if you're not going to use your motor home you're going to want to put in that stable fuel treatment on that and many of the generators they will have a place that you can actually run the generator dry so you can just shut off petcock going to that and run it out if you don't you know if you then probably what you want to do is i try to restart my generators and run them every couple of months right do you let that generator just sit there with stale gas in the carb for a year i guarantee you it's not going to start again so uh, mike uh, in your presentation you you talk about uh the batteries in your multimeter which should be in every rvers toolbox uh, yes. Talks just very briefly about why we need a multimeter. Well, you know, you don't think about this in your home, but in your RV, you've got 12 volt DC systems, 120 volt AC systems. You want to be able to check fuses. You want to be able to check battery. Somebody like me can get on the phone and 
talk you through stuff. If you know, I've got people and, and they say, I've got this wacky thing happening. I'm going, well, put a meter on it and tell me what you've got. Not having a meter can delay your re field repairs by days. It just does. So you can go get a, a three meter kit from Southwire for less than 30 bucks. And it's got a multimeter in it. It's got a non-contact voltage tester and it's got a three light tester. But guess what they all need except for the three light tester? They need batteries. <laughs> um, I just, I just sadly took a, one of my fancy meters apart that I did not remember to take the batteries out last fall. And one of them started corroding. And now I've got to replace one of the contacts in it. Now, this was not a $30 meter. This is a $3,000 meter. I was, a, I was just kicking my butt because I didn't take the batteries out. If you're going to put the meter in long storage, pull a battery out. Put a fresh one on in, in the spring. Um, and that way, um, you won't have a corroded battery making you sad. All right. Last question. Power distribution panel. We all have that in our RVs. Uh, what do we do with that? Okay. So here's the thing. This is the little known thing. Uh, RVs go down the road and vibrate, right? Your house service panel, your house is probably not traveling down the road 60, 70 miles an hour, not vibrating all over the place. But your RV does, and it basically has an electrical panel in it that's subject to vibration. Now, I, I have found that in just about any RV that I've been inside of that's been, that's been more than four or five years old, when I open up the panel, the screws on the, on the wires, the terminating the screws, are loose. Most of the time, this was not the manufacturer. The heating and cooling and the vibration causes those things to loosen up. Once they loosen up, they overheat. I have hundreds of pictures that people have sent me of wiring burning up in here that will not make your day just make sure you don't have any loose screws not only in the power distribution panel but also in your automatic transfer switch if you got a generator transfer switch all of the power goes through there those things burn up all the time and it's from loose screws sure. and if you have a loose screw and it burns up you are what we call sol well, there you we go. I know what that means. Yeah, we all know what that means. Uh, lab in Funky Town, Maryland. Funk Town, Maryland. Hey, Mike, uh, tell everybody how they can find those articles and those videos. What's your website? Okay, so I've 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 started a um, a new Substack, which is my rvelectricity.substack.com. I have well over a thousand previously published articles. So uh, go to rvelectricity.substack.com and click on that. It's all free. Um, and you can just see all the tons and tons of stuff that, that I'm doing. Mike, thank you for uh, helping us. We'll check with you in the fall and uh, we'll do things right when we put our RVs away in the fall. But meantime, you've helped us wake up our RV electrical system. Thanks for that great advice, Mike Sokol. Well, wasn't that great listening to Mike? He's always so informative. It is so great having him help us out. He is, and uh, he's a fun guy to talk to. And as you can see, you saw in the interview, he's just a lot of fun to be around from his uh, funk works <laughs> out there back east. All right, when we come back, the RV news of the week. Tired of overcrowded campgrounds, competing for reservations, paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is an emerging trend in RVing that just might be right for you. It was for us. Jennifer and I bought some land just west of Nashville, Tennessee, in an incredible collection of mountaintop properties called the Woodlands at Buffalo River. These are 5 to 140 acre properties. Build a house, a cabin, outbuildings, or RV year round, starting at $79,900. It's your property, your way, 100% ownership, and the scenery is breathtaking. You can landscape, garden, bring your pets, build what you want to. There's high speed internet, and it's so private. It's a great place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations. It's ready whenever you want. They're selling these by appointments, 5 to 140 acre sites from $79,900. There's great financing and big discounts on multi-lot packages. 
For information, visit MyRVLand.com. Now, what you've all been waiting for, the news of the week. The RV news of the week, and dominating the news this week is uh, the storms that have been hitting our country's midsection, particularly the south and the uh, upper Midwest, uh, the, the mid-south. Uh, for three weeks in a row, we've had these storms, and uh, last weekend was a terrible one, horrible uh, high winds, tornadoes, they ripped apart uh, parts of Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, and more. Um, two campers uh, were killed in a state park in Indiana. Husband and wife, they were camping at uh, McCormick Creek State Park, and uh, they had not taken shelter in the park. Uh, rescuers found their bodies in the debris that had been their camper. Uh, they had been reported uh, mix missing. Uh, we'll link to a news story in the show notes for this episode. Uh, but um, it was just terrible. And over in Iowa, in Bellevue, Iowa, the Moon River Cabins and the Riverview RV Park was also hit by a tornado. Um, Multiple RVs there were literally shredded, uh, and uh, thankfully no one died there, but several people were injured. Um, in total, five people were killed, dozens more hospitalized in this storm that was uh, uh, the topic of conversation in our Facebook group and others, and uh, just illustrates that an RV is not something you want to be in in severe weather. You know, I think a lot of us don't take the threat of a tornado seriously enough, because like in Michigan, it's not really a threat I mean, not like in other yeah. parts of the country. And you kind of, you know, just ignore it and think, ah, oh, it's not coming. And then other parts of the country, you meet people and they, the mere word, they, they seek shelter because of their life experiences. So we all need to get more serious. And these, these storms that we have had over the past three weeks are, are monster storms that uh, have just devastated so many places. So um, get out of the RV, go, go to a shelter. When you get to a campground, make sure you know where you're supposed to shelter. If there is no shelter in that campground, get in the car or start up your motorhome and leave and go to a, a public area. Every county has public shelters available. Uh, if the campground can't help you, call the local police. They'll tell you where you can find shelter. Take those warnings seriously. Safe rather than sorry. And now we've got more stories. Do you remember us talking about the uh, couple in the suburb of Denver, Denver who uh, saved their whole lives for retirement to uh, travel all over and they mm -hmm. saved up and they bought a, a Tiffin Class A motor home just to travel around the whole country. And then it was stolen out of their garage. How awful is that? Dashing their dreams. Well, after asking for the public's health and being featured in a Colorado TV news segment, police found their beautiful RV and arrested the person who stole it. The thief had been using their RV to create meth. Yeah, Not that a is, good thing. I hate to say this, but that, that's one of the prime motivations that people are stealing RVs is they take them and they go out in the woods someplace and they turn those RVs into meth labs. And unfortunately, the couple, who, like us, wouldn't know much about meth, uh, they also learned that they, they were trying to scrub out the interior to get it clean, and they didn't know that they should have been wearing a hazard suit because oh, yeah. of the uh, health dangers created by making meth. And so, you know, now they're worried about what uh, they may have been exposed to while they were doing their cleaning. I wouldn't have known that. Yeah. And uh, while the couple did have insurance on their rig, they only had $5,000 worth of insurance for personal property. Yeah, police do have a suspect. Not sure what uh, he's going to be charged with, uh, but apparently uh, he has a pretty extensive criminal uh, record. Um, but I'm glad they uh, have some closure on that, and hopefully they can get uh, uh, the next one that they get. Hopefully they can get another RV, and uh, I think they'll probably add more insurance to it. It's good another reminder to us all to make sure we have enough insurance for all the personal property on our RV. Uh, if uh, this, is a, this is a much better news story. This is the time of year everybody starts to get excited about the uh, synchronous, synchronous fireflies. The um, synchronous fireflies of Congaree National Park. Uh, they're signing up now. This has become so popular, this thing. We've been writing about it for several years. 
that you now have to participate in a lottery to get a ticket to see it. Uh, and the lottery, if April 6th, the day it opens, the tickets go live. Uh, winners will be automatically chosen and you'll know by the 17th. Uh, but the, the display uh, to see the dates uh, is in May. They think between the 13th and the 17th of May, also the 19th and the 24th. Now, if you don't know what we're talking about, um, each spring, uh, a special firefly participates in a bizarre mating ritual where the, the insects synchronize flashes in the night sky. Uh, and it's just amazing. It's like somebody's turning on and off lights in time to music or to a beat. Uh, people from all over the world come to see this. Uh, it's become so popular that the Congaree National uh, Park had to institute that lottery system. Uh, it's what we're seeing. We will put a link to a couple of articles that we've written on the RV Lifestyle blog for you to go and check this out, but it is amazing. And in case you haven't noticed, gas prices are going up just mm. in time for summer travel. Well, of course. And AAA is reporting the national price for a gallon of gasoline is $3.51 as of Sunday, and the average price for a gallon of diesel is $4.21. Uh, but this varies from state to state. And a month ago, the average price for a gallon of gasoline was three thirty-seven. And states with the lowest gas prices are generally in the South, and they include Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Mississippi, and several others. And uh, their cost for a gallon of gasoline is about three twenty-two to uh, three o two per gallon. And naturally, states with the highest costs are Illinois and then states on the west coast with California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Nevada, and others. Their prices range from 483 to 361 per gallon. And it's normal for prices to go up during the summertime uh, when many travel all over the place, you know, that's when the prices go up. Yeah, we'll put some resources uh, in the show notes uh, so you can check gas prices and find those up and down uh, tracks and where it's the cheapest to get and we'll give you some tips on how to you can explore uh, and save uh, uh, while you're driving and uh, when you're taking an RV whether you're towing it or whether you're in a motorhome so look for those links uh, in the news of the week section in the show notes at rvlifestyle.com uh, we come back the RV tip of the week from uh, Brenda the queen bee of <laughs> RV <laughs> stay with us one of the most exciting developments for RVs is happening out west in Arizona. Western Land and Ranches is selling five-acre high-elevation ranches just off the famous Route 66, the birthplace of the American road trip. And these are beautiful, secluded tracts of land surrounded by majestic mountain ranges with sweeping valley views. The high elevation is a unique microclimate as well, giving you cooler temperatures, green grasses, and tree cover, making it unique for desert property. The community is in the center of it all, close to the best of the West, Grand Canyon, Las Vegas, Lake Havasu, Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, the Colorado River, Flagstaff, Sedona, and Historic Williams. If you're tired of crowded RV parks and paying high fees for sites, well, ownership might be right for you. This incredible collection of mountaintop properties called Greenwood Ranches hit the market and it's selling out fast. There is no HOA. You can build a house, a cabin, outbuildings, or just RV. It's your property, your way, 100% ownership. Visit the website to get details and set up a showing, ArizonaRVLand.net. That's ArizonaRVLand.net. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you buy $99 or more in merchandise. You'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, 
electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. Now it's time for the RV Tip of the Week. And uh, this is a relatively new segment that we have on the podcast. It comes to us from certified RV inspector Brenda of Queen Bee RV. And uh, Brenda has a, a passion on educating RVers on how to take care of their RVs, especially and women. Yeah. Especially women is what I was going to throw in. Yeah, and uh, she's a regular contributor to the podcast. She shares her expertise with our entire audience. And she has a, a pretty interesting topic this week uh, on uh, safety tips so that you can have peace of mind about your personal safety while you're traveling. As a female RVer, I get the question frequently, aren't you scared? And I can honestly say that I mostly experience great comfort when I'm camping and for several reasons. One of the RVing choices that I make that gives me confidence is the fact that I typically camp in some sort of state or national park, Corps of Engineers or privately owned campgrounds with loads of other RVers. The campgrounds tend to be gated, have park rangers on patrol, a camp host on site, and are somewhat well lit. I personally love when other RVers have dogs because they serve as awesome little alarm systems. I also think that people are genuinely looking out for each other in these places. I have had two experiences that scared me and I quickly learned something from them. One was when my husband and I were camping midweek and ended up being the only campers in our section with no camp host on site. A local sniffed us out within an hour of setting up camp with the old, have you seen my lost dog line trying to size us up. I couldn't sleep a wink that night. The solution, know where the camp host is, inquire if rangers patrol the area, is it gated and is there a curfew, etc. And the other was a tornado weather situation. The solution, carry a weather radio in case cell and Wi-Fi reception are not available. Here is my short list of things I do or have on hand to help me with peace of mind when I'm on the road. First, a rechargeable police flashlight. I love this thing. It lights up a city block with ease and they come in a variety of price ranges. First aid kit with bandages, first aid ointment, aspirin, ice pack, the works weather radio, and understand where to shelter at the campground if needed. Cell phone with backup battery charger, and my weather radio can charge my cell phone too. A toolkit with items like duct tape, bungees, a tarp, and a tire gauge. I double check all my detector batteries for carbon monoxide, LP, and smoke. I practice opening my emergency exit windows, and I typed up an emergency plan in case of weather, fire, intruder, or medical. You will be amazed how just a few items can help put your heart and head at ease. And as time goes on, you'll gain some experience and hear more ideas that will fortify your plan. Hope these tips were helpful, and I'll see you next time on another episode. Now back to you, Mike and Jen. Thank you, Brenda. And Brenda will be back next week with another tip. Now it's time for the RV app of the week. And uh, this uh, little segment is taken from the pages of NewTravelTech.com. That is our sister blog that celebrates the many ways technology enhances the entire travel experience. And the app that we want to share with you this week is uh, from an article that uh, New Travel Tech recently did on GPS apps for travelers. And it's called the Gaia app, the Gaia GPS app. Now, if you are uh, a hiker, or a backcountry explorer, or maybe a, an off-road enthusiast, uh, one of the things that you really need are, are maps. And of course, paper maps are always great to have, but um, a lot of people love GPS maps because they can get the coordinates and everything on trails, and you can find uh, all sorts of things you need. But one of the difficulties with most of the apps out there is you need to have cell service. Well, if you're a dedicated wilderness uh, camper, you might be, and chances are you are, if you're really in the wilderness, you might be in an area that doesn't have any cell phone service. Well, this Gaia app works uh, offline. So you basically would download the apps that you want for the area that you're going to be, and then you just call up your smartphone, and whether you have internet or not, you can see it. And so you can plan your off-road travel, you can find the campsite, you can drop a pin on your campsite, and you can see how to get back from wherever you are. And it uses GPS coordinates 
um, to uh, help you uh, find um, base camp or things of interest. Uh, it's free, but like all apps, you know, to get the really good stuff, including the uh, offline access, you got to pay a, a fee. I think in their case, it's something like uh, 39 bucks a year. But um, if you're a serious boondocker in wilderness areas, I think that's a very reasonable uh, investment. If, if not, if you're in, in cell phone areas all the time, you'll still like the Apple, then get the free version, and then you can use your cell phone to access the maps. Uh, anyway, it's called the Gaia app, and you'll find it uh, listed, a link to it, on the show notes for rvlifestyle.com. Just go there and check out the podcast tab. Got RV questions of the week? Well, some people do, and we're going to answer some coming up after this. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And they'll probably be the same on your rig too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back. It's time now for the RV questions of the week. And before we get started, we should tell you that we welcome your comments and your questions about anything you heard uh, in this episode. And you can reach Jen and I at our personal email. It's just uh, Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. Okay. And our first question is from Deborah Ann. And this question was first posted Sunday night at our Ask Us Anything live stream. And uh, it has promoted a lot of discussion and soul searching by those who travel with dogs. And she asked, I was just at a harvest host in Florida and there was a tornado watch. The host said, I can come in her house, but not my dogs. I was not leaving my dogs. What would you do? Uh, that is a great question that she posed. And uh, we answered it pretty quickly. Yeah, without a lot of thought. We said... We wouldn't leave Bo. We wouldn't leave our dog. No. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we wanted to point out that she was at a harvest host and uh, that it's not a campground. They're able to camp there uh, as kind of a, you know, a, a part of their harvest host membership. But, you know, the it's not a campground, so it's not the same obligation that the host has. And I think that the fact that the host opened it up to her was, was kind and good. Uh, Deborah Ann came back on later on in our Ask Us Anything discussion. She said that the host, she wasn't mad at the host or anything, but she thought it was an interesting dilemma. She said that the host had dogs of her own, and Deborah Ann has more than one dog. So there's going to be some, there could have been some conflict. We don't know the reason, but um, she, she wasn't mad at the host for saying you couldn't bring the dogs, but she was really curious about what we would all do. And I think we all realized that our dogs are part of our family. Yeah, Bo, whenever there's a thunderstorm, if we're sleeping, he jumps up in bed with us. I, I don't know if he would run away or he'd probably scratch at the door to come in. He would not understand being left out. I don't know how, how much y'all have looked into animal behavior, but uh, I've read stuff from animal behaviorists. You know, dogs, uh, God created them as pack animals. And then uh, as they became domesticated, we became their pack. I mean, we are the whole world for our dog, our, the families that we bring him into. Uh, and that's all they have. And their whole being is caught up in, in being a part of that pack. And they uh, feel uneasy whenever they're separated from the pack. And you've seen uh, separation anxiety in some of those videos where dogs are left home alone for hours on end. And, um, you know, it's, it's cruel and unusual punishment, I think, to leave a dog alone for hours and hours on end. They're pack animals and we are the pack. You know? And particularly to leave them alone during a storm. Yeah. So. Most dogs, I believe, are afraid. You know, they know. So, so she asked, what would we do? And I think what we would do is, is uh, uh, find the nearest shelter and drive there. 
if we were in our fifth wheel, we would take our tow vehicle, and if we were in our motorhome, we would drive our motorhome there, and we would go to that uh, shelter. Most shelters will certainly take dogs, and if you're never sure of what to do, just call the local police and say, where do I go, here's where I'm at, and they'll, they'll help you. Uh, but we would go to a shelter, and as we heard in the news of the week, you do not stay in an RV mm -mm. during uh, a tornado warning or, or a, a terrible storm that's coming. Uh, so it was an interesting question. It really was. And, of course, no one has to let you let your pets in. No. I, I, you know. No one does. And, and we're not criticizing the host at all. Mm -mm. Uh, you know, with multiple dogs, she knows her dog, uh, you know, I don't know. And we don't have enough details to, to right. judge here, so don't no judging people <laughs> in your comments. Uh, all right, here's a question that came from Randy, and he says, I purchased a copy of your Natchez Trace guidebook and am planning to do the trip north to south this August. I know, not great timing. I'll be towing a 28-foot travel trailer. I guess he means not good timing because it's going to be hot there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I know of others that have made the trip with larger units, so I don't think that's a restricted size. Please let me know if it is. So my question is, are there turnouts at all the milepost stops that you suggest that I could get into while hitched up to my trailer? And uh, Randy, great question. Uh, yes. Yes, you can. All the places that we suggested. So you can bring your 28-foot travel trailer. We've seen lots of, lots of uh, trailers your size or even bigger. Most of the turnouts, you know, are in and out, so you have uh, ample room. Now, sometimes they can get crowded, um, but really, in all the times we've gone, we've never not been able to get into a turnout. There are some restricted areas. Um, right, and you need to check on that. And, and usually you'll see a sign, you know, uh, up ahead that says no RVs allowed, and it's plenty of time so you don't turn in there and then see the sign. Uh, the other thing we recommend is... Uh, Stop at the, if you're, either way, from the north to the south, one of the first stops will be the National Park Service uh, Ranger Station Welcome Center. Stop there, talk to the ranger, uh, ask him what's going on on the road, because there's often, you know, there may have been a storm that comes through, or they're fixing the roads, or a detour, uh, or something that you need to know. So always, and that's true whenever you go in any national park, anything I should know about the road ahead, any changes, also check the website. They update that on the website. but. Uh, as far as driving your 28-foot trailer down the Natchez Trace, you won't have a problem. Just you, you run on the AC in your uh, in your vehicle. I'll tell you that though, because it's hot down there in uh, in August. Right, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There you go. All right, that's the podcast for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for spending time with us. Thanks to all of our uh, contributors. And uh, we look forward to getting an email from you with your questions or comments. Again, our personal email is Mike and Jen at rvlifestyle.com. Happy trails.